war of words between Congressman Tuls Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard and Senator Kamala Harris continues to be one of the most talked about moments of last week's Democratic presidential debate. The Congresswoman from Hawaii took Senator Harris to task over her record as a prosecutor. And even after the debate, both lawmakers continued verbal sparring. In an interview with Anderson Cooper, Harris called Gabbard, quote, an apologist of Assad, referring to the embattled Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. She who has embraced and been an apologist for him in a way that she refuses to call him a war criminal. Um, I, I can only take what she says in her opinion so seriously. Uh, honestly, it's pathetic that when confronted with the facts and the truth about her record that she claims to be proud of as a prosecutor, as attorney general of California, all she can do is lob cheap smears. A lot of people criticized Kamala Harris's Assad comments regarding Tulsi. Dennis Kucinich, who accompanied Congresswoman Gabbard on her trip to Syria in 2017, called the statement, quote, an admission that she was defeated by Gabbard in the debate. Joining us now via Skype to discuss all of this is New York journalist Michael Tracy. Welcome back, sir. Great to be with you again. So you wrote a piece about the buildup to this particular um, exchange. Give us the background. Well, the background is that there was a conspicuous disparity in the way that Kamala Harris was portrayed in much of the prestige media versus how Tulsi Gabbard was per portrayed. In January of this year, the New York Times did this sort of infographic where they summarized the main qualities of all the candidates who had announced at that point or were planning on announcing. and they highlighted the, quote, history-making potential for Kamala Harris on account of her unique personal uh, traits, racially, et cetera, uh, the fact that she was a female. And yet, those that history-making potential was not touted for Tulsi Gabbard, even though she also obviously is a female, is a racial minority, would break all kinds of barriers, theoretically, were she to... Be, uh, she be too elected uh, president. But for some reason, the media isn't inclined to herald that on Tulsi Gabbard's part because they have other political qualms with her. And so that dynamic really allowed Kamala Harris to get away with a lot of talking points and so forth over the course of several months having to do with the impetus for her campaign that really hadn't gone challenged except for within certain parts of the niche media or certain you know online outlets now and then would, would call out for prosecutorial records. So what Tulsi Gabbard really did was directly challenge the core conceit of Kamala Harris's campaign by pointing out that this notion of her being a progressive prosecutor really can't be substantiated. In fact, mm -hmm. being a progressive prosecutor is kind of an oxymoron. So that's why I, I think that the, uh, the, uh, the, the attack line was so effective. It was particularly devastating, Michael, because I think it's just that Kamala Harris had not been core, she had not been challenged to the core on this. I mean, she was by a kind of like a befuddled Joe Biden who was trying to make the same point. But Tulsi Gabbard really just took her to task by point after point after point, particularly in the death penalty case. And she did not have a coherent response to that. No. So in the previous debate, Kamala Harris was touted as having this breakthrough moment because she went after Joe Biden about an obsolete issue from, you know, 45 years ago. And Joe Biden, because he is sort of befuddled and probably in cognitive decline, couldn't <laughs> respond competently. So it fell to Tulsi Gabbard, really, to uh, take up the task and actually, uh, you know, meaningfully challenge Kamala Harris on her own record. And I think, you know, she, she, she did it in a way that people really responded to because they hadn't been exposed, for the most part, to any real critique of Kamala Harris. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so that, that's why it kind of filled a void that had been waiting for somebody to, to capitalize on. And I think she was correct to, to discern that that was a way for her to get additional notoriety uh, in, in the public. And that's why I think she was, you know, once again, the most Googled candidate on that night's debate.
Mm. Michael, I, we talked about this on the show here too. I thought Kamala's response to Tulsi was cheap, lazy, and frankly cowardly. Um, if you wanted to say that thing about Assad, you should have said it to her face when you were on the debate stage yeah. with her. I mean, what did you make of that response? I saw your comments, uh, Crystal, and I agree with you 100%. It's a total non sequitur, and it's a sleazy non sequitur. What, even if you believe that Tulsi having met with Assad in 2017 is disqualifying for whatever reason. How is that responsive to Tulsi's criticisms of Kamala Harris's prosecutorial record? It's not in the slightest. It's the definition of a non sequitur. And yet that's all Kamala Harris could come up with because whenever somebody wants to delegitimize Tulsi or distract from the substantive points that she raises, they simply bring up reflexively this Assad meeting. You might remember that Tim Ryan, the hapless congressman from Ohio, as I like to call him, at the previous debate, did the same thing when he had an exchange with Tulsi about whether to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. Like Kamala Harris did, after the debate, he issued the statement calling out, you know, calling Tulsi an apologist for Assad or whatever the precise that. label is. Yeah. So, so it, this, this is always done almost to the point where it becomes a mantra for not just politicians, but also journalists who haven't really taken the time to examine her record and what actually took place on that trip. You mentioned the quote that I got last week from Dennis Kucinich, who accompanied her, accompanied her on the trip, where he points out, in addition to that quote, that they met with opposition forces, they met with religious leaders. It was a fact-finding mission that used to be standard practice for members of Congress when they want to understand better the dynamics at play in fraught foreign conflicts. And, and and yet that gets totally ignored by her detractors who don't even bother to look at the record. I mean, when Tulsi Gabbard announced her campaign in January, I did a comprehensive look at her public statements, everything that she's really said about Assad. And I could come with no come with no quote where she does anything that could be fairly characterized as apologizing for Assad or praising Assad, expressing kinship for Assad, etc. It does not exist. It's the refuge of the scoundrel, really, where all, if they, they, they want to uh, ostracize her and stigmatize her and not respond on the merits mm -hmm. to what she's actually saying. And Kamala Harris has followed in that disreputable tradition. Well, Michael, it also raises the question of Kamala Harris, what do you think we should do about Assad? And if, uh, that's, I, that's a, a real, very real question, right? It's like, well, okay, what are your foreign policy views on Syria? Do you think that we should have regime change? Do you want to have a debate about United States policy in that region? By the way, you know, if any potential Democratic moderator is watching, I think we're all waiting for that question, not just on Afghanistan. Very true. Right. Foreign policy was really an afterthought in both nights of the debates this past mm -hmm. week. I mean, Jake Tapper deigned to ask, you know, one or two questions toward the tail end when, like, most people had tuned out out of exasperation. Um, but, you know, the U.S. does have the most powerful military in world history and has troops deployed all over the world and is constantly threatening to initiate new wars. So I think it's kind of a legitimate area for inquiry, given that the president has essentially unilateral authority over military power, so I don't know. Yeah, just another just a recommendation to the later <laughs> moderators. You might want to give it a little bit more attention. I actually, it's funny. I watched a, a debate from the 2007-8 cycle recently, just to kind of refresh my memory. Uh -huh. yeah. With you know Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Chris Dodd, John Edwards, Obama, etc. And about half of it was devoted to foreign policy because you had huh. the Iraq War going yeah, on, exactly. you had right. the threatening of Iran, etc. Uh, but but you mentioned Kamala Harris's ill-formed positions on foreign policy. Why hasn't anybody asked her to clarify these things? Yeah. She, as Dennis Kucinich has pointed out to me in the discussion that I had with him last week, Kamala Harris has gotten away with just kind of, you know, making feints about what she may or may not believe about various hot-button foreign policy issues. But she's really skated without committing one way or another to a host of issues and, and, and well, Michael, uh, you know, she Syria hasn't done all the polling there yet to yeah. figure out exactly where she stands. <laughs> right. um, yeah. I'm curious really quick before we go. I mean, look, here's what I admire about Tulsi is there is nothing that requires more political courage than going against the military industrial uh, bipartisan consensus in this town, which she has done with force. And whether you agree with her on absolutely everything or not, I really admire her courage in that department. And what's interesting to me is most of the, as you put it, prestige media, which I like that term, 
really seems to have a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that maybe Tulsi's views come from like actual convictions. There's this whole, oh, is she a Russian plant? Or, you know, why, why are her views so weird, right? What's with her upbringing? And there's all this attempt to understand her rather than just maybe accepting the idea that a politician could be driven by principle and by what was, I'm sure, an incredibly searing experience serving as a combat medic in Iraq, I can only, I, I can't possibly imagine what she saw there. It's funny, I went to the 538 live podcast in Detroit this past week. I don't know why I subjected myself to that, but I did for <laughs> journalistic reasons. And one of the co-hosts, Claire Malone, didn't say anything, didn't offer any normative value judgment about any candidate, right, for the entire podcast, except when Tulsi Gabbard came up. And then a stern look came over her face, and Claire Malone said, no, 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 she's a problematic person. And it's just like, okay, what exactly is problematic about her? Can you elaborate on that, or is that just some vague belief that you've been instilled with by the media portrayal over the past several months where she's either a dictator apologizer or she is a member of a cult or she has some kind of nefarious connection to Russia that's never really quite fleshed out. So yeah, whenever a candidate challenges foreign policy consensus, and it's not unique to this cycle, although Tulsi has some unique qualities that make it extra egregious, but whenever a candidate fo uh, challenges foreign policy consensus, they end up getting portrayed as somehow weird or an oddball, or as somehow personally corrupt in a way that's never really quite defined. Dennis Kucinich had it happen to him, hmm. Ron Paul, um, et cetera, going back into previous cycles. So I think in the case of Tulsi Gabbard, the case is really harder to make because, as, as you mentioned, her military service equips her, if anybody, to level these criticisms. So that's why she's right. actually has a, 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 a usually uh, solid grounding to, to make these points. And I think that's why a lot of the people are extra skeptical of the media narratives that have been grafted onto her, I think largely unjustifiably. Look, any candidate's record or his background is open to examination, but I find with her in particular, it's done so tangentiously uh -huh. and so dishonestly and lacks so much context that you have to wonder what the overriding motivation is. And I think a lot of it is rooted in the fact that people don't know how to deal with the fact that a candidate of her stature is actually challenging the core pretenses of American foreign policy right. on a bipartisan basis. So that's why she attracts the consternation that she does, I think, on mm. a fundamental yeah. level. Yeah, I think you're right about that, Michael. Great thanks, to Michael. see you. Thank we you. We appreciate you joining us. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Next on Rising, how did Mike Pompeo go from a Kansas, Kansas congressman to secretary of state? Intercept journalist Jim Risen connects the dots and discusses Pompeo's influence on the government positions that he has held so far when Rising returns.